Hi hey guys, it's Kevin. Uh, yesterday a customer of mine ran into an issue I haven't seen in a long time, mostly because I don't do a lot of development, uh, table creations and writing procedures and whatnot. I'm mostly an admin these days. But he called or sent me an email and said, hey, we had this problem. How do we not have this problem again? And the problem was that he had an identity field in his table that they had a SQL Server crash and that number went from, say, 10,000 to 11,000 instead of 10,001. So I'm going to kind of walk you through that. And if you don't have any identity and any idea what an identity field is, excuse me, then I will basically explain that as well here on the next slide. So. There's all my contact information, pause, copy it down, whatever you want to do. Feel free to comment on the video, reach out to me on Twitter. I don't do personal uh, consulting just through emails for free. So comments are the best way for you to ask your question for other people to see what you asked because they're like, oh, I was going to ask that, but I didn't want to. So feel free to do all that. All right, let's move over to the next slide. What is identity skipping? Some people call it identity jumping. Uh, some people just go, hey, my numbers are all out of whack and I don't know why. Whatever you call it. It can be important in certain situations. First off, an identity field on a column in a table in SQL Server is basically what we used to call an auto number in Access. It just saves you the hassle of coming up with a number to put on each record to help make it unique. Um, there's no guarantee of uniqueness in this because there are ways that you can insert identity numbers like from a, from a text file that are already there so they can be duplicated unless you have made it your primary key. Um, a lot of people do add this as a primary key because no natural key exists and they just need something quick that SQL Server joins on well and so you see a lot of identity columns throughout databases all over the place. They're, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, you could start it at 10,000, you could start it at 1, you could start it at a million depending on which data type. It's an integer data type or big int or tiny int. I mean tiny int wouldn't make a lot of sense but if you've got, if you just know you're going to have a lot of data, this can actually help speed up inserts as well. And that's a little bit of a, a part of the problem. Uh, you could have it jump and only do even numbers. Well, you only do every other number. It may jump and then be every odd number. You never know. Uh, but again, it's going to look when the identity property kicks in and a new row comes in, it's going to give you a number that fits inside the data type, the int or big int or whatever. Uh, it can be useful as a primary key if no natural key exists. Uh, if you don't know what a natural key and a sur surrogate key are, please go look those up. I'm not going to do them here. But my thing is you should never, ever use this column to be what I call customer facing. Don't use an identity field for your customer number that they're going to see on an invoice. Because customer's number, you know, say you started at, at a thousand, act like you already have a thousand customers. Um, a thousand, a thousand, one, a thousand, two, ten thousand. Okay, now you look like you have ten thousand customers and it doesn't make any sense. So that's that skip. The typical skip you see here is there's intentional ones that sometimes people will do if they've got two servers that are doing the same kind of thing and moving data back and forth where, you know, server A starts at one, server B starts at a million. Uh, and then there's the ones that happen when your SQL server crashes and you jump by a thousand when you start back up. And that's the problem my customer had. Hadn't seen that in forever. I actually had to go look it up. Uh, and of course the Microsoft documentation on it is perfectly fine. And what I love going to is Pinal Dave's site because he's, do he's blogged everything. So I went there and I was like, yep, exactly the same stuff Microsoft said in a much shorter format. So moving on, we are going to kick right into a demo. As soon as I figure out where, there's Management Studio. All right, this is a 2016 instance. And what I'm going to go through is how you fix this problem on 2016 and older versions of SQL Server. There's a completely different fix for 2017 and above. They made it a little bit easier. So I've got a bunch of junk databases here that don't mean anything, so there's no customer data here at all. The most interesting thing I have is Stack Overflow and a replicated version of it. So, But I've got a blah database, because blah, why not, and I created the generic table one. I'm going to let you see what this looks like. It's only got two columns. Um, this is my ID field, and I did set it as a primary key. And again, if you're not familiar with identities, this is where you go down here at the properties of the column. Identity specification. That's basically, is this an identity field? Yes. I started at one and it's going to increase by one each time. That's what the increment and the seed are for. All right. And then I've just put a text column in there because, or a, a varchar column because I'm going to stick some, some characters in there as I do this demo. So didn't change anything. Don't need to save it. So let's go ahead and insert 10 rows very quickly into 
the sum text column in my table, that one. And let's have a look. There they are, the ident. See, all I put in was that value into that column. I didn't do this, SQL Server did it for me. That's what identity does for you. It's plain, very simple. All right, well, let's do this again. And then let's run it all at once. Do the inserts, give me all the rows, 11, 12, 13. Perfect, exactly what you would expect. But while you're doing your inserts and your application is just humming along and, and all the people are patting you on the back because you wrote fantastic code, something bad happens. Your SQL Server shut down with no wait is how we simulate a server crash. You had a drive failure, you have somebody yank the power cord out of the back and, you know, when they stepped on it in the server, who knows? SQL Server just shut down and went nuts. All right. Now, if we go into Configuration Manager and refresh this screen, yes, I have a lot of instances. That's that's for you guys. I put all kinds of stuff together. See, my SQL 2016 instance is now stopped. So let's give it a start. It won't take long. And we'll go back to Management Studio. And with any luck, I already removed the fix for this demo. Okay, back online. This may give me an error the first time I hit it. Nope, it's good. So I should have 30 rows now. 3 plus 0 is 30. All right. Let's select them all. We're going down just for dramatic effect. There's the first 20. And now we have it jumped by 1,000. Well, it technically jumped by 980, but uh, it actually was 1,000. What happened here, and there's all my rows and they're incrementing by what? What happened here is this identity field when it first started getting used or when it was first created and SQL Server was up, it cached internally or in memory, wherever it does this, and honestly, I don't know, the first thousand. So it wouldn't have to go look up, what's the next thing I can put? What's the next number? What's the next number? Back and forth. It said, I'm going to grab a thousand because you've got an identity field and I bet you're going to do a lot of inserts. Uh, I'm really tempted to use Brent Ozar's Clippy voice here, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'll just leave that with Brent. And I don't want to get sued for trademark infringement. Hi, Brent. Um, so it cached the thousand in, let's just say it's in memory. There may be some little bucket that it's in. I don't honestly know. When this happened, those went out the window and were not usable again. So when we've diagnosed the problem with the server, blah, 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 replaced the hardware, brought it on, brought it back online in Config Manager, and we came back here and we started to use this again, it went, well, I've already used up everything through a thousand, even though it was only 20 of them. So I'm going to start at a thousand, and I don't know why it went to, uh, you know, a thousand, thousand, one, thousand, two, whatever it does, but it, it jumped by a thousand, which if this is customer facing data, which I told you not to do in that second slide, now you've got potentially something the customers are going to go, ah, why did I go from order ID six to 1007? I don't understand what happened. And they're going to think you build them up for a bunch of things they don't know about. Any number of bad things can happen when customers see things that don't make sense. They immediately go into into panicky customer and they bombard your support center with questions when it was really just an actual feature, feature behavior of SQL Server from Microsoft. All right. Now the fix for this is a very simple trace flag. And did I lead my trace flag? Yes, I did. Trace flag 272. This is all of them. But if you scroll down here to 272, this disables. There's a long text here. If you just look up the doc, the trace flag document. You'll find it, but it just says, I'm not going to pre-allocate all of those and I'm not going to cache identity numbers. I'm just going to always use the next one. There might be a performance hit here. If it's not caching and you're doing tens of thousands of inserts a minute or thousands a second, you might want to make sure that your code is proper, that you're not doing this customer facing and you don't care what number goes in there as long as it's unique. Especially if you're using it as a primary key, it's got to be unique. You can't dump some more data in there if it conflicts. That's a whole different topic. But this trace flag 272 is what we're going to turn on. Now, this is 2016 and older, like I said earlier. So let's go in here to properties and get that off the other screen. Uh, startup parameters. We're going to add dash capital T 272. Add. There's nothing else on here, just my normal default startup parameters. We're going to hit OK. It's going to bark at me and tell me it won't take effect, which I know. So let's restart SQL Server. Restart. This won't take very long. I have a really nice laptop and there's basically no data in memory and I've closed all my apps. All the stuff down here that would normally be going. I'm stalling for time. This really won't take all that long. And I am going to show you the 2017 and up version of this as well, which is actually a little more granular. 
when you put this startup trace flag in, it affects every identity field, every table, every database. So that's fun. Uh, if you don't want it in one, you do want it in another. You may be looking at a multi-instance situation, but that's okay. All right, so let's do this. Let's just look and confirm that we have what we thought we had. Yeah, okay. We've got 30 records that we've put in so far. So we've restarted with our trace flag. Let's in er, insert 10 more and have us have a look at the records. Go down here. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And we'll go down here, and we're exactly where we thought we were. And look at that. All 10 of my records. So it was at 30 here, and it went straight to the next number and just kept on going. So, you know, I can do this several times. And if we see that the column's not wide enough, it will just continue to do that. That is the trace flag behavior. It's really that simple. If you must control and not have gaps in your identity uh, columns. There's no guarantee that somebody's not going to come in and change a column and change your increment in your seed, but hopefully only your sysadmins are doing that in your production system. Developers should not be touching production, blah, blah, blah. We've all heard that argument, and I agree with it. But uh, nobody should be changing the properties of this column without everybody knowing about it and understanding the impact of it, because identity fields are a big deal, especially since they're mostly used as a primary key. Okay, enough of that. Let's change this over to my 2017 instance. Change this to my 2017 as well. And I know what that one is, so let's minimize this guy and open up 2017. I have the blah database there as well. It's just create database blah. There's nothing fancy in here, no special properties. I've got my table one with my columns. Right now, because I'm on the 2017, I think this is empty. Yeah, as it should be. So we'll go through the same exercise. We'll Put 10 rows in there. Well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> did this fail? Or did I put them in master? <laughs> One row is affected. 10 rows of data. All right, I'll track that down later. See where I stuck all those rows. I wasn't looking for error messages. Okay, so... We could do this a couple of times, and we'll get 10, 11, 12, 30. Exactly what you would expect. Let's crash the server again. That's the 2017. And we'll go in here, and we'll see that... I really wish that refresh, well, this would auto-refresh. But it, 2017 is now stopped. We will start him, because we fixed whatever it was that caused it to crash. All right, back to Management Studio, wherever that went. Okay, let's go back over here. Make sure all of our data is still there. 20 rows, 20 rows, nothing changed. Add some more rows. And we have the same exact problem because I haven't fixed anything yet. This is the default behavior. This 2017 instance that you're looking at, I installed that in front of a bunch of people at some presentation I did at a SQL Saturday or whatever, or possibly one of my DBA Fundamentals classes. So it was basically just walk through the install and I've left it alone since then. So, so we have the default behavior. Now, this is how you change this in 2017 and above. It's a database level configuration, so it's more granular. It doesn't affect the entire instance, and I'm not setting a startup parameter. Oh, just to prove I didn't do anything weird. I'll go in here. At least I don't think I did anything weird in here for a different demo. The startup parameters, yeah, it's all the basic ones. So, you know, MDF, LDF, AR log, that kind of, those things. All right, we're done with those. So, the identity cache is on, because I was reversing things as a practice for this. If you want to turn that caching feature off, cross your fingers that this actually works. It did. Yay. And we're back online. We've got this. Let's insert 10 more rows. Where do we at? 30 now. So those came in just fine. Crash the server. Repair the server. Yay, we're getting really good at fixing servers here. I'm impressed with you guys. You know your hardware. All right, now, 10 more rows, so we're up to 50. So rows 40, 41 should be sequential. 
and they're not. So something broke. Am I on the right instance? Use blah. Okay, and we're back. Took about three minutes to do a little bit of troubleshooting there because something didn't behave like it was supposed to. My syntax was exactly correct. I'm in the blah database. I'm on the 2017 instance. Uh, I think we left off at 40 rows where it jumped from 1,000 to 2,000 on me. Okay, I don't know why it did that, but I did a couple of restarts of my instance, didn't rerun any code, and now I'm able to insert successfully. So what I'm going to do just to show you that, get that out of the way. All right, so we're at 70 rows. Let's go down to 80, 70, 20, 31. Those are all sequential like you would expect. Crash the server. Go back over here. Refresh. Restart. Or start because it's off. Da -da -da. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the problem was on that. And I did restart wondering if perhaps it didn't take because the database was online. I didn't try an offline online or detach or any of that stuff. And that may have been it. I'll dig into that a little bit further uh, and if I figure it out I'll put it in the comments on the video okay so that's back in there we're at 80 rows cross your fingers that I haven't reduplicated the error unexpectedly so 70 to 71 would be the new ones perfect and this is only affecting the blah database so if I had any others here that I didn't actually care about or that I didn't that I wanted to do caching because of the high-speed inserts and because my identity is not customer-facing, then that one can do it. So those are some considerations you have to take uh, is what you're going to do and when and how you're going to use an identity field if you're going to use an identity field. We'll get those things back up there for you. But that last point, I can't stress enough that you should not let this be customer-facing because if you get it out of the way of the application and the invoicing and the reports and whatever else the customer might see, and the customer might be your internal users. If you get it to where it's just a pure record locator and as a primary key, that's probably what it should be since it's not a natural key. None of this matters if you design your databases properly. It's okay to have an identity column just for fast inserts and a customer number column. You might want to have a customer number be like TX0001 for my first customer in Texas. That's their number. I won't tell you who they are, of course, but... You know, and I've got CO for a Colorado and CA for a California. So I've got a, I've got a Varchar customer number, but because I just don't use it that often. When I do reports and everything, I'm joining on those identity fields in a table. I want the speed that I get from identity joins versus text joins. All right, that's all I have. Uh, comments on, the, on at the bottom are great. Comments, questions, whatever, within the scope of this video. Don't just turn around and ask me how to set up a backup process in the comments on, the, on a YouTube video. Uh, if you need other help, go to Twitter and go to, <clears throat> excuse me, hashtag SQL help, and a bunch of the best people in the world will fall all over themselves trying to help you. Or dba.stackexchange.com uh, is fantastic. Uh, make sure you know how to ask a question there, or they're gonna they're gonna harass you, or at least close your question if it's too broad or not enough detail. Or MSDN TechNet forums. You can ask anything you want there, and somebody's gonna try to help you. Maybe even somebody from Microsoft, maybe me. So if you have a quick question, throw it in the comments. Love to hear from you. Have a great day.